Hi, it's Daniel Kraft coming to you from Silicon Valley. It's a real honor and pleasure to be with you today and to get to spend a few minutes kind of discussing what's the cutting edge and future of health and medicine across the health continuum. So this morning I got up and thought I'd do a little bit of art. Of course, I'm not really a very good artist, so I had a little help. Of course, like many of you, I've been playing around with Dolly and exploring things like GPT-3 and soon to be GPT-4, which is going to have really interesting implications for healthcare, including what can pass a medical exam. And I think we're going to rapidly enter an era of sort of generative health, where our environments will meld and mold to our prevention, diagnostics, and therapeutic needs. And it's an example of how health and medicine can get more digital, more connected, more intelligent, data-driven, and even crowdsourced in our new metaverse age. Of course, health is wealth, and the future of healthcare is often driven at this convergence of accelerating, sometimes exponential technologies. About 12 years ago, I gave my second TED Talk, and the theme was, you know, how the, the medicine's future, there's an app for that. At the time, there were only about 20,000 apps, but it was at the convergence point of apps and digital and mobile that were really starting to reshape healthcare 10 years ago and bringing us entire new fields that didn't even exist 20 something years ago when I was a Stanford medical student, which really are enabling us to do things differently across health and medicine. Now, these new tools give us a new way to imagine what's possible today and the next five, 10, and even 20 years. I know it's your 10th anniversary. I wanna encourage you not just to think about the sort of sick care side of the equation, but even health and wellness, not just longevity, but health span as we go forward into this new health age and give us this opportunity to frame about where we are today and where we might go next. It's a really exciting time, but we need to be uh, thoughtful about the art of the possible, particularly with where are we today? You know, when I go back to visit Mass General Hospital where I trained, we're still using fax machines. We're still using paper forms. In fact, when I had a cardiac study done at Stanford last year, I got my results on a CD-ROM. I don't even own a CD-ROM player anymore, do you? And so we need to understand that we're still sometimes thinking in our old mindsets, waiting rooms, and ways of designing our healthcare systems and academic platforms. And what we really need to do is start to converge these silos to bring us integrated biomedical knowledge that can bring us information at the bedside or increasingly at the website. Now, our, we've seen lots of disruption and lots of business models, how we do our digital banking, how we get our digital entertainment. And of course, our entire planet has been horribly disrupted over the last three years of the pandemic. And the pandemic, I think, has opened our eyes that while many fields have reached that fourth industrial age, healthcare is sort of stuck in the fourth or third or sometimes only the second industrial age. But COVID has been a bit of a catalyst. What took off in 10 years has often happened in 10 months or less. And as the optimist that I think most of us are, I like to see, just like Sputnik set off the space age, COVID has sparked a bit of a new health age, whether it's in telemedicine, or new forms of vaccination, or new forms of collaboration. So last year, 10 years after that other TED Talk, I gave a new TED Talk, how COVID-19 is transforming the future of health and medicine, which gave me a bit, a little, bit of a lens I wanted to share today about, you know, where were we 10 years ago? On your, and where are we today on your 10th anniversary of this amazing gathering? And where might we be in the next 10 years? And not to have a failure of imagination, because most people tend to overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. I think the next 10 years will make the last 10 years look slow. So I've been looking at this future of medicine for a while. I've uh, been running a program and founded a program called Exponential Medicine, now called Next Med Health, where we bring together from people from 40 different countries and all sorts of different fields to look at the future of health and medicine in new ways, and not just the new technologies, but new mindsets. I love this quote shared by the head of NHS Innovation. The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but sometimes in escaping from the old ones. So what old ideas might be holding you or some of your colleagues back? And hopefully some of you can join us next month in San Diego for Next Men Health. I know we're lucky to have Sangeeta Reddy on our faculty as well. So 10 years ago, where we were with genomics, genome cost almost 10,000 US dollars. 10 years later, it's about 200 US dollars. A decade from now, it might be $10 or almost for free. And even today, we can start to use our pharmacogenetics to pick the right drug and the right dose uh, for the right indication, or start to take our crowdsourced genomic information and understand a complex disease like type 2 diabetes at different genomic subtypes. And of course, it's not just the genome. We have the proteome, the exposome, the sociome, the microbiome, how that plays a role in health and disease. And of course, as we start to have exponential amounts of these new omics, we can start to integrate them and synthesize them to what's often called the digital twin. So I think this next day, decade will really bring us to this era where we can really integrate this information 
and use it for smart, personalized prevention, diagnostics, and therapy, even in my field of oncology, to give smarter, more precise therapeutics. Now, of course, a lot of this work is writing exponential technologies. We all know the power of Moore's Law, which is why the supercomputers in our pocket really can be much more powerful than a crazy supercomputer from a couple of decades ago. And soon Moore's Law will be supplanted by quantum computing, which will have incredible roles to play in AI meets drug discovery and beyond. But back to our exponential technology in our pocket, the smartphone, right? That's evolved relatively quickly and has all sorts of applications. My iPhone 13 is already almost antique and rumored soon to come this year will be the iPhone or the Apple glasses where we'll start to dissolve and integrate that into our visual fields or contact lenses that can integrate visual and healthcare information. And so this new world of augmented virtual extended reality, 10 years ago, we still had, you know, our now antique Google Glass. Now we can start to integrate complex information into the clinical sphere to guide surgeons step-by-step -step through surgeries or to maybe start to guide crowdsource information, a bit of a ways for healthcare to upskill all sorts of healthcare workers. So it's a time of crowdsourcing information in the OR and beyond. So just like we have driver assist in our modern cars, so we'll have clinician assist to help upskill all of us. Diagnostics is certainly on the exponential. 10 years ago, we saw the very first glucometer connected to a smartphone. We saw the first prototypes of an EKG on a, on, a, on a phone as well. 10 years later, you can go on Amazon or see advertisements on CNN and get a EKG six lead that you can buy as a consumer device. And we've also seen new ways to medicalize even the smartphones of today. You can modify the speaker and the microphone to look in your kid's ear and diagnose an ear infection. The blood pressure cuff that's still squeezing your wrist will soon dissolve with radar-based and LIDAR-based technologies, which will give us real-time blood pressure, even, even non-invasive blood sugar. What do we do with that sort of information? We don't need to wear anything. We're in the era of invisibles, where we can take this information and bring vital signs just to anyone with a smartphone or a laptop. And so we can think about now this age of the medical selfie. For example, Healthy IO, a startup out of Israel, can replace the urinalysis basically with your smartphone camera. Instead of bringing the urine to the lab, you can diagnose a urinary tract infection or preeclampsia or early kidney disease in your home with the press of a button on your smartphone. Other things are becoming invisible. Is voice is a biomarker that can detect neurologic diseases or the sound of your cough. Is that coronavirus, a cold, or tuberculosis? Now, what's getting interesting is in the last decade, we can start to measure our behaviors, particularly our bad ones, particularly the behaviors that drive most of our chronic diseases. We're only 13 years since the first Fitbit launched. I'm sure many of you have some sort of wearable on like I do. And we can start to use these wearables and otherables to measure almost every element of physiology and disease. In fact, our digital exhaust, our digitome is starting at just at the cusp of being used in powerful new ways. From patchables, from wearable ultrasound patches that were just published, to sockables to track the health of a diabetic foot, to underwearables, internet of things in your underwear, all the way to, of course, ringables, consumer devices that can track our sleep or start to predict uh, pregnancy five days before a home pregnancy test, or now even be used to predict a COVID titer after a vaccine booster. Now we have patches that could basically be an intensive care unit level of data streaming ICU levels of information. It doesn't even take a complex wearable. A simple wearable can be sent home with a patient after a total hip procedure. Are they walking more as expected or walking less? If they're walking less, maybe we can intervene early before they ever fall. And on the diagnostics or imaging exponential, now we have the ability to do a full body MRI, still a bit expensive, but now we're seeing smaller portable MRI machines. Or soon in the next decade, I think you go to your local pharmacy and get a full body scan uh, image with AI and a radiologist to really give early screening and early prognostic information. Or wearable diagnostics that can pick up brain tumors or uh, strokes. So for many of us who are clinicians, we don't need the clinic anymore. A lot of that can fit into our digital doctor's bag. And they're getting smarter, like a stethoscope that can listen to your heart sounds, do an EKG, and diagnose a heart murmur much better than I can. Or we're going to get rid of stethoscopes all, all together with now low-cost, smart, portable ultrasound devices, which can really democratize where diagnostics and care can be done. It's really a powerful age to pick up information and provide it anywhere on the planet. And what's exciting is this is being enhanced, of course, with not just AI, but IA, intelligence augmentation, enabling anybody to help do radiology or diagnose eye diseases and predict from the back of an eyeball scan. Digital pathology is here and certainly uh, colonoscopies being enhanced by AI assistance. 
Now, none of this, of course, replaces human touch. We need to integrate that in smarter ways. The human touch is really important in blending what humans can do and robots and machine learning. So AI is not going to replace your doctor, nurse, and pharmacist, but AI, but healthcare systems, clinicians, pharmacists using AI will replace those who don't. So, of course, this is all now coming together in this new age of what's often called digital health or mobile health or connected health. I like to think of digital health as the ability to connect the dots between all these new forms of data and make it hyper-personalized and useful. And of course, we're now starting to design, to prescribe not just drugs and devices, but digital therapeutics for everything from smoking cessation to mental health to video games that can treat things like ADHD. And this brings us to an era where we can not just have quantified self data collected on our smartphones, but shift to quantified health where this data is going to flow to your doctor, your, to your healthcare system to do early prevention, early diagnosis, and therapy that's much smarter and much more data-driven. And we'll bring us to an age of true predictalytics. We'll, we'll be able to understand and synthesize this information for each of us and our patients, a bit of a check engine light for the body. Or as we can already see today, that our wearables can predict that you might have COVID two days before you have symptoms. Now, one of the challenges and opportunities, there's now many, many thousands of solutions out there. How do you make sense of them all? So I've just recently built and launched a platform to do that. It's called digital.health. Digital.health is a website you can go to today, a bit of a digital health formulary and, data, formulary and database. You might search for new forms of diagnostics, find a technology like the LiveCore EKG, understand its evidence base, save it in your own formulary, start to prescribe it to a patient, uh, and sort of use that as a, as, a, as a platform or for searching for tools related to diabetes or almost any other medical issue. So give it a try, digital.health. Now, the challenge and opportunity is to pull all this information together. It's already overwhelming today. No clinician wants more data. We want the actionable insights and to close the loop into our workflow and align that with our incentives. And we're going to start to see this converge in real-time information. We're at the cusp of reinventing clinical trials where almost everybody can be a data donor, just like we now drive with Google Maps or Waze. We're going to start to see the Google Maps and Waze of Health learning from thousands and millions of patients and clinical encounters. So we can all not just be organ donors or blood donors, but data donors and integrate that into our just-in-time information. Now, of course, we've shifted quickly into this new era of telemedicine or hybridized care shifting us from very intermittent episodic data to a future where, which, which is today still very reactive, we wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack or a stroke or late stage cancer. What's coming next is much more continuous data from our wearables and otherables and our internet of medical things that will enable us to be much more proactive, much more personalized and start to bring care anytime, anywhere at much lower cost around the planet. And increasingly take us from hospital to hospital, care anytime, anywhere. And the care, of course, is often being virtualized, not today, maybe with a chat bot talking to a, doc, uh, talking to a doctor or nurse, but these chat bots will get smarter, GPT enabled, bringing us not just from the universe to this new integrated metaverse. In fact, your doctor may soon turn into an avatar. I was turned into an avatar just the other day in Los Angeles. So many of our clinical encounters will seamlessly integrate and bring us new levels of high touch care. Uh, sometimes with a headset on, sometimes with our augmented reality contact lenses. So we need to change our medical education. How do we teach a medical student or a nurse to enter this new realm, not just to have good bedside manner, but good website manner? Now, our opportunity in this age of Internet of Medical Things is to take often, which often massive amounts of silo data and connect the dots. We don't want more data. We need to go from data to new information and insights, and then narrow the gap between that being useful, again, at the bedside of the website. And certainly COVID has been a catalyst. Many of you in the health IT world have been speeding up that integration. So we're really entering this new exciting health age. I think when you have your 20th uh, anniversary meeting, we'll see incredible new leaps. It's a time of super convergence, not of any one technology, not just health IT or VR or omics or 3D printing or nanotech or blockchain, but the integration of them all that takes us into this new promise. So don't just think about where we are today in 2023, skate to where the puck is going to be in 2025, 2032, 2033. And if we have that new exponential mindset, we can go from our intermittent episodic sick care age to one that's continuous, proactive, anytime, anywhere, AI enhanced with aligned incentives. So let's not take incremental steps. Let's together take exponential steps. The future of medicine is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Many of you are creating that technology. And it's up to all of us and all the incredible people in this room to not just predict the future, but to build it collaboratively, forward thinking together, to build better health and medicine for us 
all around the planet from India and beyond. So with that, I encourage us all to go build that future. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Have a great rest of your sessions.